It's time to cover all those wonderful games mainstream sites won't talk about until they're trending on Reddit. Strap yourselves in, it's our first volume of Hidden Gems. Available now. Parat is a game I've been covering forever. I still had Yachts as fanboys convinced I was a conspiracy against him, and though we worked for the same website, when I first previewed what would become the various parts of just the first of three episodes of Czechoslovakian dystopian Cold War Half-Life meets Quake meets Blood, boom shootin' bliss. There's two reasons I'm not doing a full video of Herat. One, because to spoil the sheer weirdness of the game is to do it a great disservice. Seriously, this game is a riddle wrapped in an enigma aiming to give you a prostate exam with a pitchfork while a mutant version of a former communist leader chases after you with spider legs. And that's not even like the third weirdest thing. Two, because seeing it in action tells you more than my words ever could. Every clip you're seeing, all the madness, pair it with some of the best balanced and inventive scenario design you'll ever experience. Herat is brutal. Herat is enviably smart, truly. If you want to know how to do good level design, look at this game, it's incredible. And Herat is so good that it makes it easier to accept that the third episode kinda shits the bed. Only kinda, and it's honestly the briefest episode, so you're still riding high, but yeah, it, it kind of is a little bit of a letdown right at the end. Everything else though, including the endless mode, is just frigging rock solid. When I agreed to look at Dust and Neon, I'll admit, I was conflicted. On one hand, it had the makings of great presentation and solid gunplay. On the other, it's the latest in a sea of roguelike twin-stick shooters. It would have been exceptionally easy for this game to fall flat on its face as a generic bit of action, but lo and behold, Dustin Neon is anything but. The story and attempts at comedy aren't what you'd call outstanding, but that's not what you're here for. From the genuinely incredible reload animations, I love that it pops up really close and personal, it's just a great touch, to the satisfying cone of effect aiming system, playing Dust in Neon is outstanding. Its creators clearly understood that game feel is the lifeblood of this kind of experience, and they roll with it beautifully. Everything is fine tuned to perfection, it all flows well, the different weapon options and classes feel great, there's an isometric friendly cover system that works perfectly, the enemies are well varied, the universe, while yes not bolstered by the best story, is at least visually and sonically quite pleasant to navigate, it's really well done, it knows how to introduce you to this kind of game if you've never played a rogue before in your life, and it just substantially punches above its weight despite only costing a fistful of dollars. Speaking of shooting from strange angles, Theus Thou, from the creator of Rot Flesh, is a curious mixture of dynamic puzzles and shooting. Think Hotline Miami, but with the brain-tickling depth of Portal, except instead of ripping holes in space-time, you're telekinetically wielding guns to dispatch enemies in the way of saving the royal heir you're sworn to protect. It's super minimalist despite a fair bit of lore revealed in text logs, with the emphasis almost entirely on solving each new level. It has the same vibe as all those old Flash games on Congregate and Newgrounds, which is either a plus or a minus. Cause you can skip any level that's proving too hard, but the difficulty even on normal can be outright crushing in the final stages, demanding reflexes and forethought greater than the controls usually allow for. Still, despite another case of a rough finale, the journey getting there is more than worth the price of admission. So, I have a confession to make. I really, really didn't care for Vampire Survivors. Crazy, I know. It was akin to watching paint dry for me. I just really prefer something that's a lot more engaging that pulls me in as opposed to something so passive. As such, you can imagine my delight when I received an email about Vampire Hunters, which solves the paint drying issue of slowly waltzing around a bunch of Castlevania mountainsides with instead a hybrid of Doom-style ever-aggressive combat and the escalating weapon complexity of your infinitely expanding arsenal in Survivors. As a result, yeah, Vampire Hunters is definitely more challenging than its primary inspiration. It's still a mostly mindless monster mash, but there's actually enough to engage with that if you're like me, you can finally get something out of the experience. The current early access build has two levels, and they're looking to build upon it just like Survivors did before that. Bolstered by solid game feel, colorful monsters, and plenty of upgrades to grind for, the new Survivor-like trend at last has some bite. What to watch? 
and the theme of unexpected hybrids continues with Luna Abyss, which manages to be as gorgeously gothic as Chronicles of Riddick while offering a modern take on Metroid Prime meets Quake boom shooting. Luna is definitely up there in terms of neither looking nor sounding or even playing like a humble indie project. This feels like at least AA if not AAA quality, yet never sacrifices its fiercely original setting of AI gods, physical viruses, and eldritch lock-on shootouts. Everything from the platforming to the enemy design was tight as a drum. The only thing I could see being an issue is precisely the part that makes it so exciting. It's so uncompromising that I fear some people will brush it off for its wildly esoteric dystopian future. It has all the curious ponderings of The Invincible, but with vastly better pacing and immediately more engaging gameplay. Seriously, while this might look a bit on the weird side, don't let a potent first sip turn you off. Luna Abyss is shaping up to be something truly spectacular, I'm barely certain of that, it was an incredible demo. Speaking of demos that caught me by surprise, I did not have Hitchcockian thrillers as a new subgenre of adventure gaming on my bingo card, but I am so okay with it. Between the recent adaptation of Hitchcock's own Vertigo, plus Jennifer Wilde and the spin-off of Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries, and now we have This Bed We Made. It's steadily becoming a fascinating creative melting pot for modern adventure games on a whole. Where its peers have styled themselves after Telltale, Choose Your Own Adventure, and a visual novel, This Bed We Made goes boldly into the territory of L.A. Noir. While not boasting as complex a facial animation tech, though the faces are actually convincingly animated, it's more about 3D environments you can pull of puzzles and clue deduction, heavy detective analysis, all paired with the need to maintain the deception that you didn't catch on to someone by leaving your own clues as a nosy maid. The demo I played was contained to a single room, but escalated so rapidly in tension I was gripped until the very end. I love how you also have to keep doing your job, cleaning up the room as you go. And all of this is left up to you, it's a level of detail that you usually only see with like an immersive sim, and it's great to see it in another genre. To say much more is to spoil too much, but within the 20 minutes I played, things went from a kind gesture and curiosity to cracking locks and uncovering potential blackmail. If the rest of the game is just as gripping as this, then this bed we made might be a sleeper hit adventure game in the making. Meanwhile, I may be one of the 10 people who remembers Lionel's train town, but I suspect the team behind Station to Station can also be counted among such illustrious players, while with their beautifully rendered train-based puzzler that feels like a loving homage with its own distinct flair and twists. Despite looking like a folksy economic sim at first blush, or maybe just kind of like a world terrarium sort of situation, this is all about optimizing your railroads to score as many points as possible at the lowest cost. Unlike a lot of puzzle games though, it never tells you how to do things. It's nowhere near as restrictive as so many puzzle games that have been coming out. The mechanics are fluid and messy enough that you can get away with some janky or downright deviously clever railroads. That's why Station to Station is absolutely on my watch list now. It's a puzzle game that understands creativity is as important as attention to detail. Optimizing your resource rotations for maximum output, especially with one-time use card modifiers, makes for a remarkably engaging time, while the sedate, voxel-based visuals and upbeat score fill you with wonder. Truly a sublime time. It's surreal how the team at Me 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 went from kid-friendly action platforming to grim self-tactics, but after their success with Shadow Tactics, they found a unique balance between the two that's aimed at slightly older players, but it's nowhere near as dark as Shadow Tactics. Make no mistake, Shadow Gambit is Pirates of the Caribbean as a stealth tactics game. Fortunately, all that voodoo magic, dark comedy, and refined practice from years of working the genre has paid off. Though there's still some blemishes in AI pathing and inputs from the demo I played, Shadow Gambit is easily shaping up to be a thrilling eldritch adventure where you get to finally enjoy all the anti-hero powers, usually exclusive to the antagonists in other stories. Seriously, even like in the intro cutscene, they just beautifully illustrate how you get to do all kinds of crazy things because all of your crew are technically dead. It's fantastic. And while you're going up against an Inquisition, I like how they actually lean into it in a way that outside of like maybe Dead Space, I've not really seen a portrayal of dangerous dogma gone wrong in a way that actually makes sense and makes you feel good for kicking their asses. Like this is some really interesting stuff and I want to see where it goes. Plus I love that they went so far as, as to make the save system an in-universe explained concept via MacGuffin. And the brilliant art direction, the superb voice acting, it's 
all just so good. So good. I'm really excited to see where this goes. And finally, by far the most surprising of this volume's finds has to be On Guard. A loving tribute to Zoro that blends ideas of Shadwin, Arkham Knight, and Witcher to wonderful effect. Starring a femme fatale who swings both ways, you take on a corrupt government, one idiot goon at a time, in a lighthearted but mechanically complex adventure of sword slinging hijinks. Not only is there a full campaign planned, but the demo even included an early glimpse at the arena challenge mode where you can test your might, harnessing physics objects, skillful yet intuitive swordplay, and parkour to win the day. It feels equally modern and retro inclined, with an aesthetic and physics that's equal parts PS2 and DreamWorks film in execution. Really, my only issue is that sometimes the pacing of combat can be a little jittery, but it's to support ample responsiveness, which is a worthy sacrifice. I'd much prefer that than the stiffness of, say, Jedi Survivor. While I initially worried, as there's been other Arkham-inspired indies that have fallen flat, On Guard shows the promise of being a true heroic ballad in the making. 